Good morning and welcome to another edition of the Cumberland Christian Church Online Worship Service. We're glad that you're joining us today. Um, we're looking forward to being together, singing some songs, sharing a communion time, and diving into the Word of God uh, through Jesus Christ. Uh, he just shares a great story with us in Mark chapter 12, which we're going to look at in a few moments. Um, but I want to begin with a, a couple verses of Scripture from uh, David. Uh, David wrote Psalm 23 about the Lord is my shepherd. But right after that, he has some more great words to share with us. Psalm 24, it says in verses 9 and 10, Lift up your heads, you gates. Lift them up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is he, the King of glory? The Lord Almighty, he is King of glory. And that's why we're here today in worship is to lift up the King of glory, the one who is the great I am, the one who has given us life, breath, has given us everything that we have. We have reason to celebrate today. And so I'm glad you're with us. Even if you're a guest uh, who joined us for the first time, we are so excited to have you with us in worship of God. So let's begin with a word of prayer and we'll dive into to worship. Uh, Lord, we come to you. We thank you for the day. We thank you for the opportunity to be together, uh, even if it is virtual. Lord, we know that you say where two or three are gathered. We have come together because you are the king of glory. We want to lift you up in our songs, in our praise, in our uh, commune with you. And, and just as we listen to your word, Lord, speak to us. We want to experience your presence uh, because you are such a great and mighty God. Thank you for those that are watching. Help us, Lord, to worship you now in spirit and truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Everyone needs compassion, love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness, kindness of a savior, the hope of nations. Savior, he can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, he rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. find me, all my fears and failures, fill my life again, give my life to follow, everything I believe in, now I surrender, my sin. the mountain 
give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. Great are you, Lord. It's your breath in our lives, so we Good morning and welcome to the communion portion of our service today. We're glad you could worship with us, even if it is in a virtual environment. You know, COVID-19 has presented us with many challenges. It has made it difficult, if not impossible, to share in group activities. We have been challenged in our ability to work, educate, and worship, even go to the store. Our new normal is much different than what it used to be. But these were challenges and with challenges come opportunities to serve in new ways. Obstacles are not necessarily bad. They can provide us with stimulation to grow and explore our relationship with the Lord. Sometimes we can become stagnant, complacent, and even satisfied with mediocrity. Have we embraced the new situation? Are we willing to search out new paths and fresh avenues to pursue? Have we opened our hearts to God's calling in this new environment? All too often, when things aren't the way they've been in our lives, 
we get out of our comfort zone and we begin to fear the unknown. We become fearful of what lies ahead. There are times when we can demonstrate our faith by trusting God, our Lord and Savior. In Proverbs 3, 5 through 6, we read, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean into your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. The ultimate demonstration of trust and obedience was Jesus and his willing sacrifice on the cross. He trusted his Father even unto death. As we walk through the challenges of COVID and the COVID-filled environment we're in, let us concentrate on walking in faith and ensuring we use the situations we face to demonstrate that faith and trust the glory of God. Let us pray. Lord, these are unusual times, but we know we can trust in you. You have led the world through many different situations, and you are the one true and steady source and rock of all that is good. Lord, as we gather around the communion table this morning, we remember the sacrifice that Christ made and the trust he had in you. For it is in Christ's name we pray. Amen.
shall come with trumpet sound. Only I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless stand before the On uh, September 19, 1983, Bill Crothers and Jane McCormick uh, got together and they introduced the television world to a new game show that featured these little red creatures that were furry. And uh, when you hit one of their squares on a box, uh, it would come up and it would sing a parody song or it had some cute little statement. They were called whammies. And uh, Pressure Luck is one of those uh, game shows that's kind of fun to watch because the whammies come out and they share this little uh, parody with you or uh, they have this cute little statement they uh, give. And uh, so it, the game show is built around contestants, three contestants. Uh, they sit there and they answer trivia questions. They collect spins uh, through the answers they give. And then they turn around and they face the big board. And on the big board, uh, there's these money values. And so they're trying to collect as much money in the game as possible without hitting the whammy. And if you get four whammies, then you're out of the show. And uh, it, it's kind of fun to watch. And I don't know how many of you have watched the, the show before, but Pressure Luck, according to the websites that I saw, uh, is ranked 12th in the number of uh, top 25 game shows of all time. And so it's one of, their, one of those shows that's up there and people enjoy. Uh, according to Wikipedia, the new episodes of uh, Pressure Luck are going to come out at the end of this month. And they're going to be, uh, Elizabeth Banks is going to be the new host of the show. And so it'll be kind of interesting to see what that's like. I don't know, uh, as we go through this COVID virus and as we're dealing with things, some of us may feel like we've been whammied by different things. Uh, you know, maybe you've gone out and uh, to the grocery store and feel like you've been whammied by the, the, the fact that there's a mask that you have to wear in some stores and not others. And sometimes we've been whammied by the boss who says, hey, uh, unfortunately, we're going to have to let you go. Uh, maybe we got some uh, families that have been whammied by uh, bills that have been collecting um, and, and we don't have the money to pay for those because of uh, everything else that's going on. And so uh, maybe some of us feel like we've been in pressure luck where uh, we've been out there and we've been trying and uh, we feel like things are coming against us. You know, it's not a game show. It's real life for us. And it's not been much fun for us as we uh, go through this. And so uh, I'm glad you're with me this morning as we're going to look at a passage of Scripture in Mark chapter 12. Uh, it's obviously not got whammies in it, but uh, Jesus is the center character, and uh, somebody's going to try to lay a whammy on him. They're going to try to trick him, trap him uh, in their uh, scheme. And so uh, let's look at our text this morning, Mark chapter 12, verses 13 to tw uh, 17. It says here, uh, Later they sent some of the Pharisees and Herodians to Jesus to catch him in his words. They came to him and said, Teacher, we know that you are a good man, uh, full of integrity, you aren't swayed by men because uh, you pay no attention to who they are, but you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. Is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay or not? But Jesus knew their hypocrisy. Why are you trying to trap me? He asked. Bring me a denarius and let me look at it. They brought him the coin and he asked them, Whose portrait is this and whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then Jesus said to them, Give to Caesar what is Caesar's, and God what is God's. And they were amazed at him. When we look at this text and begin to understand where it's coming from, Mark has been writing about the life of Jesus. We've been looking at this using game shows, and we've uh, seen how Jesus has made his way into Jerusalem during this final week of his life. 
Uh, he's preparing for Friday when he'll die on the cross. And as Jesus has been dealing with the final week of his life, he's uh, been in the temple area. He's been around the religious leaders. They've been after him, and, and they're angry at him. They're frustrated. They're, they're infuriated with him because of what he said, what he's done. And when we get to chapter 12, Jesus uh, begins with a parable of a tenant farmer. And the tenant farmer is trying to collect the fruit from the, the, the crops from the, the, the fields and the people take the son of the tenant farmer and they kill him. And as Jesus wraps up this parable, the religious leaders understand that Jesus has been talking about them. And it just infuriates them even more. They're, they're, they're fuming with rage at Jesus. And that's why it says in verse 11, uh, they looked for a way to arrest him because they knew he had spoken this parable against them. But they were afraid of the crowd, so they left him and went away. See, they wanted Jesus to go away. They wanted to silence him. They wanted to uh, put a whammy on him, get him out of the game so that they could return to power again. They could uh, get rid of this problem that was leeching the people away from them. And so as we look at this text today, we're going to look at the fact that Jesus was dealing with a crowd that was after him, trying to press their luck and asking questions. And so as we think about how this applies to us, I want us to think about, uh, would we ever be willing to press our luck when it comes to our relationship with God? We see these individuals pressing their luck against Jesus, and we would say, oh, we would never do anything like that. But the reality is, we need to take a look in the mirror and ask ourselves, has there ever been a time when we tried to challenge Jesus? Where we tried to rebel against Jesus? where we tried to see how far away from Jesus we could get without leaving His grace? Has there ever been a time when we said, you know, I can get away with this because Jesus really isn't watching or, you know, Jesus really isn't going to get that mad about it? Uh, Are we pressing our luck? If we are, then it shouldn't be a surprise to us when we get whammied uh, or when we have whammies come into our life. So let's take a moment and pray and then we're going to look at this text in greater detail. Lord, we come to you, we thank you for the day, and I thank you for this text, and I thank you for the opportunity to share this message. I know that uh, some of us uh, are, are wrestling with things in our life. We, we see uh, challenges ahead of us. We see all the things that are happening in our world today, and uh, we just want some clear clarity from you. So speak into our lives when it comes to how we can uh, d- develop a stronger faith in you, how we can uh, avoid uh, uh, tempting you or testing you or or trying to trap you in your words, but instead we can uh, develop a, a deeper, more personal relationship with you. So Lord, speak to us now through Jesus Christ, in whose name we do pray. Amen. When we look at uh, Ma- uh, Mark chapter 12 and we look at this story, um, one of the lines from Pressure Luck that uh, always spoke in my mind or always comes to my mind is just one more spin, just one more spin. You know, the three contestants, they've got their spins that they won from answering trivia questions. And, you know, they're being egged on. Oh, you, you need to go one more. How good, there's the big bucks uh, sign on there. And so uh, the, oh, one more spin. I'm doing this, you know. And I think about the religious leaders here in, in Mark chapter 12 as having that same thought. Just one more time, we're going to try to get Jesus. We're going to find out how we can trap him in this moment. So I, I want us to look at their proposition it, here in verses 13 and 14, it says later. You know, they went back to their uh, headquarters. They went back to the temple area. Uh, they went into the board meeting room, and, and they sat down, and the high priest is there, and some of, of the religious leaders that were close to him were there, and they're discussing, how can we get Jesus? How can we trip him up? How can we trap him? How can we defraud him in front of the people? And so the high priest most likely said, okay, well, let's send our brightest and our best to get Jesus. And so it's kind of interesting. It says here that the Herodians and the Pharisees came to Jesus. Now, when we open up our, our Bible and begin to understand who these groups are, the Herodians were a group of individuals that uh, were in the temple area, but they were friends of Herod, the king of Israel. They were more interested in appeasing the Romans and the political powers than they were staying true to God's word. And so they very much were, you know, let's try to get Jesus to uh, uh, do something or say something that would uh, embarrass him in front of the Roman government. 
On the other side of the coin, the polar opposite of that, you have the Pharisees who are very much stuck in the traditions of their past and the religious, and, you know, we've got to do everything for God and forget the Roman government. And so you have these polar opposites, and they come together as the best and the brightest of their group to find a way to trap Jesus in one of the two extremes or one of the two sides. And so they come to Jesus later in the day, after they've had time to prepare, they've got their cliff notes, they've got their um, plan in place of, you know, you ask this and you ask this, and this is our side and this is our side. They come together and they bring a proposition to Jesus. What do you think? You're this great man. Notice how they use flattery. You aren't swayed by people. You don't care what people think. You're just going to teach the truth. Oh, you're a man of integrity. It's a salesman, you know, the, the, the political leader that's going to tell you whatever you want to hear to butter you up so that they can reach in your back pocket, grab your wallet, and drain you dry. That's what these individuals are doing here. In Jude chapter 1, which is, there is only one chapter, Jude chapter 1, verse 16, it says that they will use flattery to their own advantage. These religious leaders, they're not interested in an answer to the question. They're not trying to figure out how to pay the taxes or not pay the taxes. What they care about is trapping Jesus. And so they're using this flattery to their own event. Oh, Jesus, you're such a wonderful guy. Tell us what you think. No, that, their proposition is, is, hey, we want to trap you. Say something wrong. Make a political gap that's going to bring you down. So when we move on in the text, we see that not only do they have a proposition, but they have the motivation. And their motivation is to trap Jesus. And and Jesus knows that. It says that Jesus knew their hypocrisy. He knew what they were up to. He could see it in their eyes. And I can picture Jesus, you know, he's got his disciples behind him. He's standing there, and the religious leaders, they begin their uh, statements. They begin their questioning of Jesus. And Jesus, he's got his eyes. Here they go again. Or maybe he chuckled under his breath, you know, here they, you know. Or maybe he just bowed his head in disgust. You know, here they are trying to flatter him, trip him, trap him. And Jesus knows what they're up to. And he says, look, bring me a coin. Bring me a coin. Now I have a coin here in my hand. Tell me whose inscription, tell me whose image, portrait you see on this coin. And as they look at the coin, they get the, you know, someone's got it in their robe or their pocket and they pull it out. And Jesus says, tell me, who's there? You see, their motivation wasn't to know the truth. They didn't want to know whether they should pay taxes or not. They already had that in their mind. They'd already discussed that. What they were thinking is we can find a way to trip Jesus up. We can get him involved in a, a bear trap that he can't get out of. And Jesus knew the bear trap was there, and he said, no, I'm not going to step in that. Here's a question I have for you. Now, to bring this a little bit to a close and looking at our text today, uh, I want us to think about the reaction of the people, how they responded. In verse 17, Jesus said to them, give to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God." You know, Jesus gave this brilliant answer. You know what's on the coin. You see the Roman image there. You see the Caesar's image. There's no national coin for the Jews anymore. What they had in the temple was a shekel that would have the image of God. And so Jesus is saying to them, look, you give to God what is God's, and you give to man what is man's. But Jesus wasn't going to fall for the trick. And so it says here that the people were amazed at his response. They were amazed at what Jesus said. See, in Matthew's account, it says that they came to Jesus and said, what's your opinion? You know, wide open. What do you think? They were laying the trap, and Jesus said, I'm not going to fall for your trap. What Jesus did was he said, look, you tell me. Here's what you need to do. You need to give to God what is God's, and to Caesar what is Caesar's. And it says they were amazed. They realized Jesus outsmarted them. Jesus saw the trap for what it was, and he walked around it. He avoided it. And the people were amazed. Now, we know the religious leaders, they were upset. They were furious. And, you know, as we read on Mark chapter 12, they will come back with another question and another opportunity to try to trip Jesus up. But the people that were watching this, maybe it was the disciples, maybe it was the crowd that had gathered around to see this fight going on, they were amazed at what they saw. In Romans chapter uh, 13, uh, Paul is talking about how we should respect the, the government. And in verses 6 and 7, he says, you know, we need to give to 
uh, the government, the dues that are due, the taxes are due. Uh, and Paul was saying we need to very much be in uh, support of the government because we are paying them full time to watch over us. Jesus was saying the same thing here. That's where Paul got it from, was from Jesus. You know, the reaction is, is we need to give what is appropriate to those that deserve it. And Jesus wasn't willing to step into that. And so Jesus didn't get whammied. But in fact, what we see is that the religious leaders whammied themselves. Now, to bring it back uh, to the Press Your Luck show, um, one of the reasons the show hasn't been on all the time, uh, if you notice it's been on and off the air, is uh, when it first started, there was a scandal that uh, broke out in the show. Michael Larson was one of the first contestants um, to be on the show, and he had actually memorized the sequence by which the little lights go to the 18 different boxes. And as he slow-motioned the show on his VCR tape, he began noticing there was a pattern. And if you go on the website in Wikipedia, you can actually read the article, but it shows that box four and box eight in the first round only have dollar amounts. And the second round, it has dollar amounts plus a free spin. And so in his show, he won $110,000, which was a record by far of anyone on the show. And the way he did it was is he knew where the whammies were not going to be. And so he had memorized the pattern, the sequence by which the boxes would light up. And he would always hit four or eight. Or, you know, he knew which ones to hit at what time. And so he had at one time more than 40 spins in a row. People were amazed at what he did. They didn't realize the trick at first, but after the producers went back and watched it, they began realizing he knew the pattern. And so they had to go back, and they've now created a 32 sequent pattern uh, system so that no one can repeat the feat that he did in doing that. But Michael Larson's story is not one of success. He didn't get away clean and free. When you look at his life story, we realize that shortly after the show, uh, he lost a lot of his winnings in scams. And at the age of 49, in 1999, he died of throat cancer. And so Michael Larson's life wasn't, you know, where he, you know, came away clean and free and, and celebrated great success. You know, he got whammied. Um, and, and it's unfortunate. And so today what I want to like to do is to use this story, the backdrop of Pressure Luck, to talk about how we can avoid being whammied in our own relationship with God. How we can avoid those moments where we feel like God is coming against us or taking things away or where we feel like God is uh, oppressing us or where we just feel like bad things keep happening to us. How can we avoid those moments? I think there's some things that we can pull out of the story that will help us. And the first of those is we've got to try to avoid thinking that we can outwit Jesus. See, these religious leaders, they came to Jesus with an idea that they were smarter than him. You know, here's this country bumpkin that keeps coming around, and, you know, he has great things to say, but, you know, he's not smarter than the best of the Pharisees and the best of the Herodians. This is the A-team. These are the guys who have studied long and hard. They're the ones who are the top of the class, the valedictorians of their degrees, and they were the ones that were going to find the way to uh, take Jesus down. And unfortunately, what we see here is they didn't win. You know, sometimes we come up with these trivia quotes. I'm going to stump Jesus. I'm going to stump God. The reality is, is we can't outsmart God. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians is talking about the wisdom of this world. And, and listen to what he says in verses 19 and 20. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness in God's sight. And it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise are futile. You know, sometimes we think that we can outsmart God, you know, I can do this sin and, and God won't know. Uh, I don't think that's the way it works. God catches us in our wisdom and says that my wisdom is far superior to yours. It's not that God's trying to show us up. It's not a contest. But it's one of those things that God is all-knowing. There's no game. There's no trivia question that we could ask God. And God's going to, oh, I don't know. God is all-knowing. So instead of trying to outwit God, we need to trust in the Lord. We need to trust that God knows what is best, that God's word is best for us, that God's will is best for us in our life. 
we can try these games, we can come up with these schemes, we can plan all this stuff, but we can't outwit God and Jesus Christ. It just doesn't happen. Second thing that I think we can pull out of this story is that we need to stop trying to uh, outplay God. You know, the, here's the religious leaders. They come to him and, and they, they say, hey, uh, Jesus, we know that you're this man of integrity. We know that, you know, they were trying to flatter Jesus with their words and their actions. You know, how many of us have sat in a, in a prayer time and we've heard, you know, our uncle or the preacher or somebody, you know, they go on and on with all these names. You know, they find every name for Jesus or every name for God in the Bible and they try to put it in the prayer so that it sounds great and impressive. You know, or maybe, you know, you've uh, come across somebody and they, oh, you're the preacher. And then they change their language, you know. Oh, my Jesus, you know. Uh, you can't outflatter God. God is not going to go, oh, look how impressed I am that you know every name for me in the Bible. God wants us to be honest with Him, to shoot straight from the heart. Let Him know what's on our mind and what's in our hearts. He already knows, so there's no flattering. Uh, I found it interesting, and there's an Old Testament passage that David wrote in Psalm 12, and he says, Lord, uh, cut off the lips of those who flatter and the tongue that boast." What would our world look like today if God were actually going to do that? That he cut out all the tongues of those who are boastful and he cut off all the lips of those who use flattery. Boy, that would be a strange world, wouldn't it? Some of us might have some issues communicating tomorrow. But God isn't quick to do that. But the reality is David is saying, look God, these people who flatter and try to flatter you, they're fooling themselves. God sees through our hearts, our minds. He knows what we're up to. So just be honest. Just be honest with Him. God, I'm struggling. God, I'm having this issue. You don't have to come up with this laundry list of names. You don't have to come up with this long flowing. Jesus said, hey, look, they, their vain repetition, God doesn't like that. He's not interested in that. They, they think they're impressive because of the long flowing prayers and God really isn't impressed by that. We whammy ourselves when we try to outwit and we try to flatter Jesus. The third thing that I want to pull out of here is when we try to trap Jesus. We whammy ourselves when we try to trap Jesus. The religious leaders, you know, they come to Jesus and say, hey, hey, you know, what do you think? You know, should we pay taxes or should we not pay taxes? You know, and Jesus said, I know you're trying to trap me. And Jesus had been around for a while. He knew what was going on. We go back to the Gospel of Matthew in chapter 4. Jesus is out in the wilderness. And out in the wilderness, the devil comes up to him and says, Hey, Jesus, um, you know, um, you're the Son of God. You can change the bread into uh, the stones in the bread. Jesus says, Yeah, but man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from God. Second temptation, the devil says, You know, uh, you can do this. You know, and if you'll do this, and Jesus says, look, you're not supposed to put the Lord your God to the test. Jesus knew what the devil was up to. He knew what these religious leaders were up to. They were trying to trick him. Now, as teenagers, we never did this, uh, I'm sure, but, you know, did we ever try to trick our parents when it came to them uh, telling us what we couldn't do? And, you know, we would, uh, you know, make a secret way to get out without them knowing or, you know, all my parents will never know, you know, that we were doing whatever. I'm not going to admit anything on TV because my parents might be watching. But you know what I'm saying. You know, we fool old mom and dad. But the reality is, is when it comes to God, there is no fooling him. We can't trick him. We can't trap him in his words. It's not like, oh, you got me. God's going to say, look, you knew what I said. You knew what my word said. You know what the commandments were. You knew what I desired of you. And you didn't do it. You chose to disobey. You chose to try to circumvent. You were looking for the loopholes. You're like the attorney that's trying to, to find a way out of the, 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 the crime or whatever. God says, look, let's be honest. So instead of trying to trap Jesus or trying to trick Jesus, we need to 
honor the Lord with our lives. We need to honor His Word, His will for our life. Because that's what's going to make our lives better. It's when we try to circumvent or we try to trick or trap or, or deceive God that we whammy ourselves. And if you ever watch uh, Press Your Luck, you know that if you get four whammies, you're out of the game. So trying to outwit, trying to flatter, trying to trap Jesus, there's a fourth whammy that I found in this text. When we look at this, we see the religious leaders were trying to silence Jesus. That's why on Friday morning, you know, after all this week and after all these things are going on, the, the religious leaders are at Pilate's door on Friday morning. Not, hey, Pilate, come on, you've got to take care of this. We can't get Jesus to shut up. We, we. And, and Pilate says, I, he's innocent. I'm not going to, I'm washing my hands of this guy. And the religious leaders say, you got to. You're no friend of Caesar's. They were trying to silence Jesus. They wanted him to go away, to shut up, to stop preaching, to stop doing these things because they knew that they were, Driving the, he was driving the people away from the religious establishment. And the reality is, is it hasn't stopped. You know, when the apostles were alive, you know, they tried to silence them. You need to stop talking about Jesus. You're infuriating people against us. You're bringing people against us. You've got to stop or we're going to do something really bad to you. We're going to whammy you big time. And Peter said, look, you can try to stop us, but we can't stop talking about Jesus Christ. The reality is we can't silence God. On the triumphal entry, they, they came to Jesus and said, hey, you've got to get these people to stop talking about you. You know, you got to stop. And Jesus said, look, if the little kids stop talking, the stones are going to start crying out. You can't silence God. Oh, we can put the headphones on, we can blare the music, we can try to put cotton balls on our ears, but we can't silence God. Jesus Christ will continue to speak into our lives, whether we like it or not. And we can try to drown it out with alcohol and drugs, and we can try to prescribe things to, to medicate ourselves so that we don't hear those voices, but the reality is God will continue to try to speak into our lives because He loves us so much that he wants to have an internal relationship with us. So instead of trying to silence God and Jesus, we need to listen to what God has to say. We need to listen to Jesus Christ as he tries to speak into our lives through a friend, through a post, through a song, through a text, through a card. Whatever way he's trying to speak to us, we need to listen so that we don't whammy ourselves and get kicked out of the game. In Luke chapter 13, verse 17, again, Jesus is dealing with the crowds and the religious leaders, and it says, they were humiliated. The religious leaders were humiliated by Jesus. It's not that Jesus set out to humiliate them. It's not that he was trying to embarrass them or shame them, but they did it to themselves because they tried to silence Jesus. And the same thing happens today when we try to silence Jesus. Look at the people in our history. Learn the lessons of those who've gone before us. When you try to silence God, when you try to silence Jesus Christ, when you try to put an end to religion and Christianity, you fall short. We don't remember them as successes. We remember them as failures. Jesus cannot be silenced. He is the King of kings, the Lord of lords. He is the one who was, is, and will always be. In the end, we know who the victor is. It is Jesus Christ. You can't silence him. It's like me trying to jump to the moon. I can try all day long, but it ain't going to happen. We can press our luck all we want, but we're going to just keep whamming ourselves. I, I love the whammies on the show. You know, they would come out and, you know, they would do a parody or they'd have some funny statement. I was watching a, co a compilation video where, you know, they had a bunch of them put together. And uh, one of them was really cute. Um, the guy was dressed, uh, the whammy's dressed up as Sherlock Holmes. He's coming out, and he's got a dog on a leash on one hand, and he's got a magnifying glass on the other. And as he's walking in front of the dollar signs, he says, it's elementary, my dear Watson. It's the greed that got him. I think that's a great statement, not only for the game, but for life as well. It is greed. It is pride. It is autonomy that 
keeps us from succeeding in life. When we try to trick God, when we try to trip Him up, when we try to silence Him, when we try to outwit Him, we end up hurting ourselves. So if we want to avoid being whammied in life and ultimately being whammied out of eternity, we need to trust in Jesus. Listen to Him. Honor Him. Be honest with Him. That's what God desires most. And so I hope that you see in this message it's not a, all fun and games. There's a seriousness to this message. A lot of us, you know, we would love to be on pressure luck and win big bucks. But the reality is, in life, it is not about money. It is about eternity. And we don't need to press our luck. We need to put our faith in Jesus Christ. And that's what I'm asking today as we wrap this message up. Where's your faith? Is it in luck? I hope. I believe. Or is it in the assur assurance that Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior? If you don't have that certainty in your life, I want to pray for you now as we close out this service. Lord, I come to you and I thank you for the day. And I know so many of us, you know, we, we think about pressing our luck. You know, I'll put my $10 down on a certain number and see if I can win the big bucks. Put it all on a, a certain horse and maybe I'll come out the victor with a couple extra hundred in my wallet. You know, we press our luck when it comes to, well, God, you're a God of love. You would never send anybody to hell. Or we try to trap you. Well, you're a good God. You would never punish me for this little sin. The reality is your word is true. It hasn't changed. There's no loopholes. So, Lord, help us not to try to outwit you. To use flattery as a way to gain the upper hand on you. Help us, Lord, to, to lose that uh, desire to find a fault or try to silence you in our life. Help us, Lord, to honor you, to listen to you, to trust you, to be humble before you. Lord, thank you for Jesus Christ. What a great example for us. What a great Savior. Lord, if there's someone that's listening today, I pray, Lord, that they will hear this message. It won't be the whammies that they remember, but they will remember the truth that your Son, Jesus Christ, is the only means, the only way to eternal life. That's my prayer in Christ's name. Amen. I want to thank you for joining us today for worship here at Cumberland. Um, I know that over the last several weeks, we've had the opportunity to uh, just celebrate and to worship through Facebook and YouTube. And we're so appreciative of everything that has been going into making this happen and for your support through this. Um, as I close out the service, I just want to share with you again, if there is a decision that needs to be made, whether it's to be baptized, whether it's to join the church, or if there's something that you really feel burdened about and you want someone to join you in prayer about, give us a call, send us a text, shoot me an email. I'd love to talk to you, love to share with you uh, in that decision. I also want to let you know as we wrap up this service next week, uh, the mayor of Indianapolis has given us the, the opportunity uh, to open our doors restrictedly uh, in, in a very restricted manner. And so what we're doing is we're going to offer a worship service for 25 people. And I know that doesn't seem like much, but we're asking you to go to our website. There's a link there where you can register to come and be a part of the service. And uh, if there's more than 25, uh, we're going to create a waiting list. And uh, if we get enough um, participation in this, uh, we'll even look at having a 4 o'clock worship service in the afternoon. So I encourage you to go to our website. Look at the Discover page. Uh, there's a statement on the COVID-19 and our reopening plan. There's an opportunity for you to... Uh, Get registered so that you can join us for next week's worship service. But I also want to assure you, uh, I know a lot of you are a little uh, leery about coming back to the church with the virus and you're being told if you're a certain age or a certain underlying conditions, maybe it's best to wait a little bit. 
I want to assure you we are going to provide our online service next week uh, to the best of our ability. So uh, if you can't be here, if you don't feel like you can be here, uh, look for us on our website. Uh, look for us on our Facebook page. And uh, we plan to have a service there for you as well. Just like those who are here, you'll get to celebrate what God is doing in our lives. So we look forward to seeing you next week in worship.